A warm welcome and good morning or good afternoon, accordingly to your current vocation, to our guests, students, faculty, alumni, colleagues, and friends. Thank you, for, uh, thank you all for joining us at the School of Architecture and Design of New York Tech. And special thanks go to our esteemed panelists for their generous availability to participate. My name is Giovanni Santamaria and I'm Associate Professor and Chair of the School of Architecture and Design at New York Tech. And I'm pleased to share with you a welcome message from our Dean Maria Pervellini. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for investing your time with us today. We are grateful to all of you for your interest in this virtual event. I am Maria Perbellini, Dean of the School of Architecture and Design at New York Institute of Technology. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the Archipelagos of Changing Habitats Symposium. This is presented by the Master of Science in Architecture, Urban and Regional Design program in our school in collaboration with the University of Genoa, Department of Architecture and Design, Master of Architectural Composition. The spring and summer 2021 lectures and events series at the School of Architecture and Design creates opportunities to discuss how architecture, design, and urbanism can disclose implicit parameters and activate structural transformations in our ecological, social, and built environment. We are engaging with the theme of this year's Biennale, How Will We Live Together? And a commitment to actionable strategies for a more responsible and inclusive approach to the reinvention of our cities, to climate ambitions, advancing new knowledge while blurring disciplinary boundaries and working across fields and expertise. New York Institute of Technology and the School of Architecture and Design are participating in the 17th International Architecture Biennale 2021 in various forms through events, exhibitions, and installations at the Italian and Korean pavilions. And this event today is also part of the virtual Italian pavilion, City X Venice, curated by Alessandro Melis and Tom Kovac with my creative directorship. The Archipelago Symposium traces new concepts and emerging horizons for different ways to inhabit the urban, rural, dense, non-dense conditions of specialized urban constructs. It is also considering current challenges and opportunities that emerge from systems that take into consideration technological, environmental, and social cultural domains as catalysts for future urban scenarios. And now please join me in welcoming the event's moderator who will introduce the symposium, Marcella Del Signore, Associate Professor and Director of DMS in Architecture, Urban and Regional Design at the School of Architecture and Design. My warmest welcome to our esteemed guests, Cristiano Leprati, Vittorio Pizzigoni, Emanuele Sommariva, Richard Weller, Sarah Williams, and Jörg Schroeder. Marcella, please take it from here. And thank you so much to everyone participating today, accepting our invitations. We are very grateful for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Perbellini. I will pass this back now to Chair Santa Maria to introduce the moderators. So our moderators today are, uh, as we heard, Marcella Del Signore, who is an associate professor and director uh, of our MS program in architecture and urban and regional design at the School of Architecture and Design in New York Tech. Cristiano Le uh, Lepratti, professor at the Department of Architecture and Design at the University of Genoa. 
Vittorio Pizzigoni, Associate Professor and Director of the Master of Architectural Composition in the Department of Architecture and Design at the University of Genoa, and Emanuele Somariva, Assistant Professor at the Department of Architecture and Design at the University of Genoa as well. And now, Marcella, the floor is yours, and good luck. Thank you. So hello, everyone, again. And uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. So good morning, good afternoon, or evening to all. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, uh, Dean Per Berlini, uh, thanks Giovanni Santa Maria, the chair, the lecture and event committee at NYTSOED, and thanks everyone for being here. I want to also extend a special thank you uh, to the University of Genova, uh, Department of Architecture and Design for the collaboration on this event. Uh, and this event is a collaboration between the MS in Architecture, Urban and Regional Design, and the Master in Architectural Composition. And we really look forward to uh, continuing uh, to work together on future initiatives. So we're very pleased today to have an amazing group of speakers. Um, thanks again, everyone, for your participation. And I will uh, start introducing our three speakers today. We have Richard Weller, Mayerson Chair of Urbanism and Landscape Architecture and Director of the Ian McCart Center for Urbanism and Ecology at the University of Pennsylvania. Sarah Williams, Associate Professor of Technology and Urban Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and Director of the Civic Data Lab, Design Lab at the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism. Jörg Schroeder, Professor and Chair of Territorial Design and Urban Planning and Director of the Institute of Urban Design and Planning at Leibniz University in Hannover. So again, thank you for being here and we really look forward to your presentations and to the discussions afterwards. So I will start uh, with a quick introduction about the event and, uh, uh, and also some key points that can for the discussion afterwards. So today's event, Archipelago of Changing Habitats, will discuss new concepts and emerging horizons for ways to inhabit conditions of specialized urban constructs while considering current challenges and opportunities where technological, environmental, and sociocultural domains serve as catalysts for future urban scenarios. Introducing the planetary scale as a framework, the planetary is understood as relating to or belonging to a planet or planets, and relating to the Earth as a planet. In the planetary, many parameters are at stake that reveal not only the singularity of their actions or influences, but on the contrary, the complete codependency and entanglement of bodies. In facing the planetary, William Connolly expands on the politics of pluralization, capitalism, fragility, and secularism to address the complexity of the Anthropocene. Codependency cap coupling cause and effect determine the deployment of such system and their mutual influences. Within this frame framework, earth system science is a new field of scientific research aiming at understanding the structure and functioning of the earth as a complex adaptive system. Within earth system science, the term anthropogenic refers to the influence of human beings on nature and designates an effect resulting from human activity. Anthropogenic territories are in states of flux, expressing processes, objects, or materials derived from inhabitation, use, formation, mutations, as opposed to those following nature without human influences. As planetary scale reproduction occurs, Increased level of anthropogenic mutation exponentially count the homogenization of urban forms and public realms. These conditions make us reflect on the interdependence of such systems that voluntarily or not are terraforming the planet. The formation of Earth is a process that has taken place over millennia. And as production and reproduction of urbanization continues, this process has to be seen holistically as a process that continued of continuous transformation of earth system. And this process is inherently and deeply connected with the anthropogenic and resulting from it. All of this again, make us to reflect on the comparative planetology. These terms come from Kim Stanley Robinson from which the earth perhaps as a mediating police can only be taught through aesthetic or forms derived from, from not imposed upon where subdivision inversions 
localization and, adoptation and adoptions, adoptions increase the divide from again inside and outside. This has made us to reflect on how the notion of archipelagos and habitats are shaped through visible and invisible forces and how forms of urbanization might occur through interdependent processes and how these relations are contingent on environmental, technological, cultural, social, and political conditions, reconfiguring continuously the connection between inhabitation and forms of urbanization. I will now pass the floor to Cristiano Leprati, professor at the University of Genova in the Department of Architecture and Design for intro notes and welcome on behalf of the University of Genova. Cristiano, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. I'm very pleased to be part of this event and happy with the collaboration with the New York Institute of Technology because it allows us from the University of Genoa Department of Architecture and Design and a Master of Architectural Composition to be among so many important guests and friends. This event is the first of a series called Archipelagos of Changing Habitats of which I will now introduce the structure and the argumentative framework. Um, the metaphor of the archipelago visualizes with the rhetorical figure, the urban model of the cities within the city, explained in Berlin as Green Archipelago by Oswald Matthias Ungers, where the reciprocal relationship between architecture build the urban space. Each event is a topic that corresponds to a scale. Today, we will start with the territorial one, in the next, we will address the urban scale with the sub metaphor of the sea and the architectural scale with the sub metaphor of the island. Why is form relevant again? Common to the different scale is the topic of recognizability and formal definition of the limit. The metaphor of islands transfer the idea of economic self sufficiency and self-governance to the level of physical organization. Form is therefore understood as density and completeness in opposition to what is not form. The form that allows to recognize the limit between the city and the countryside, between finite and open space. In Aurelius definition, form is an instrument of political resistance to the expansive forces of the urbe that implies total agiographic and undifferentiated urbanization. For Aureli, form is political. In his book, The Possibility of an Absolute Architecture, he contrasts the model of the polis with the urbe, which builds its identity and its finiteness and its relationship with the place, polis. Why is the model of archipelago so relevant today? In the era of the global city, the climate crisis and self-confinement due to the current pandemic are slowing down the global phenomenon of urbanization that seems unstoppable. It can become a stable trend if smart working is adopted as a common practice in the post-COVID era, without exception. Office district and main financial cities such as New York, London and Milano are emptying due to the combination of social distancing and digital transition, as well as the rediscovery of an augmented domesticity. Perhaps as Kulas states in his last exhibition, Countryside the Report, it's, it's time to move the core of our interest back to a new idea of countryside connected by ICT infrastructures and community services. Hence, the need to fight against soil consumption, the urgency to optimize the use of our resources, and the pressure for public health provisions require an open reflection among the disciplines of architecture and communities on the concept of density as a design paradigm on which to experiment new forms. Against this framework, the archipelagos of changing habitats symposium today will discuss new concepts and emerging horizons for way to inhabit post-COVID urban, rural, dense, not dense condition of specialized urban construct, while considering current challenges and opportunities where technological, environmental, 
and sociocultural domains serve as catalysts for changing urban scenarios. Thank you for your attention. And now, Vittorio, the floor is yours. Thanks, Cristiano. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my task is somehow redundant uh, since I have to introduce uh, Richard Weller, our first uh, well-known speaker and his lecture titled Behind the Archipelagos. Uh, Richard Weller is a Mayerson Chair of Urbanism and Professor and the Chair uh, of Landscape Architecture and Co-Executive Director of uh, the CAG Center at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. He teaches subjects in the history of ideas of nature, contemporary urbanism and advanced design studios. He is also a very admired teacher. Besides uh, his work as academic, he works uh, as a consultant specialized in the formative stage, stages of design and planning projects ranging across all scales. In 2005, Pen Press Monograph acknowledged his design work spanning over 30 years. Weller's creative work has received numerous international awards and has been exhibited in many galleries around the world. Weller's re recent research concerns global flashpoints between biodiversity and urban growth. Today, he will give a lecture titled Behind Archipelagos. This lecture concerns the relationship between urbanization and biodiversity at the planetary, regional, and site scale. In the lecture, he will uh, see how spatial practice design has a fundamental role to play in avoiding the apparent inevitability of the next extinction. Richard, it's a pleasure to let you take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So can you all see the screen? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. Um, so a lot of interesting things have been said in the introductory comments and much of it is music to my ears because it sounds very landscape architectural. And I'm not just saying that so as to imply that the discipline of landscape architecture has always been talking about these things, but it's fair to say that we kind of have since 1969 when Ian McCarg famously wrote a book called Design with Nature. His construct of nature as a thing was problematic and remains problematic, but nonetheless, um, the question of how we can reorient ourselves philosophically and materially to the way in which the earth system actually functions is an area of knowledge that is just dawning upon us on the occasion of the Anthropocene and the sixth extinction. And the fact that architects are talking about this and urbanists are now talking about this, I think is a remarkable turn of events. Um, the problem for landscape architecture has been not its philosophical um, motivations and orientations, but its inability to translate theory into praxis. And that's something that we will all struggle with and is really the subject of a different symposium. Today's symposium, um, we will connect theory and practice. And I will try to do that in my brief presentation as I shuffle from a planetary scale by way of introduction down to an urban scale and a design scale. So I begin with an image on which you can see two worlds. And these two worlds represent an utterly dualistic conception of life on earth. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see planetary urbanization, this extraordinary mesh of what we call civilization and the enwrapping of the entire planet with a form of global intelligence that no other species has achieved in evolutionary history. Um, this is what we typically refer to as culture. If you look at the image of the very same world on the right-hand side of the screen, you see what we refer to typically in common parlance as nature. In the image on the right, 
what you see is the archipelago par excellence. This is an archipelago of the actual, this is an accurate image of the, of the earth. All we've done is deleted all of the land that is not protected. So all of the little islands that you see on that image are today the so-called protected areas of the world administered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature out of Switzerland. And this has been an extraordinary achievement by the conservation community who've been out there politicking and wrangling to secure the world's conservation estate. And um, I would, the, the essence of what all this is about and the historical moment that we are in, I think, is simply to put these two worlds back together again. The world on the left, the world of urbanization, is extraordinary for its degree of connectivity. The image on the right, the archipelago of fragments of protected area, is actually profoundly problematic from a conservation perspective, from a life on Earth perspective, precisely because it is an archipelago. All of the species that are protected in those isolated protected areas will not be able to survive climate change unless we open up pathways for genetic flow between all of the fragments that you see in the image. It's, there is something from a conservation, from a biological perspective, profoundly wrong with the image on the right. It's the very opposite of what you want for a thriving ecology. So we have to put these two worlds together and um, what we've created, what we've achieved for humanity in terms of global connectivity, we need to now try and achieve for global biodiversity. And to do that means, of course, to achieve connectivity and join those fragments up into a, 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 um, 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 a resilient system really means, on the practical level, the renegotiation of land use on a planetary scale. So to put these two worlds together, you can make a fantastic image such as this, where the urban and the biological are enmeshed into a form of endosymbiosis. And that, I think, is the historical challenge of the times. And that is a design problem and a planning problem and a political problem and, yes, a philosophical problem. I want to focus on the conservation world um, and then I'll come back to the urban world. That's the path I want to take you through today. There are two really important words in conservation discourse, which is, these are the two most important words in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is the binding document for 196 nations around the world in terms of managing biodiversity, urbanization and land use. And those two words are representation on the one hand and connectivity on the other. Representation means that if you have a really um, the, the best model of a conservation, of a global planetary conservation estate, is that the 867 eco-regions of the world are all represented in your conservation estate. Now, that is not what we have. The archipelago of fragments that you see in the image now are ad hoc, random results of politics and, and, and particular interests that are, and, and, and struggles over the last 60 or 70 years. They do not represent evenly the 867 eco-regions of the planet. Connectivity, as I've already mentioned, means that these, ideally, these fragments of isolated protected areas that you see in the image would be connected with one another to form a coherent holistic system enabling species to migrate over time and adjust to the pressures of climate change. The key statistic is something called Aichi target number 11 in the Convention on Biological Diversity, which stipulates that the 196 nations of the world who are signatory to that convention will achieve 17% of their sovereign territory as protected. That was the target to 2020. We did not meet that target. We fell just short of it. We are currently at a global protected area or a state of about 15.4%. So there's only 1.6% to go, if you like, to meet the target, and then everyone can pat everyone on the back. These targets will probably be revised for this, the UN decade on ecological restoration, and they might blow out to 30% or something more ambitious. The famous American biologist E.O. Wilson has called for half the planet to be protected, i.e. 50% of the world's terrestrial surface area, but 17% itself, one-fifth of the world's terrestrial area, is already a very ambitious target. 
As I said, we are close to achieving that, um, but we, we are short. Now you think to yourself, okay, we've got 15.4% of the world's terrestrial area protected. We need to get to 17% to meet the political targets. It's not much, but actually it's a lot. When you calculate it, it's nearly 700,000 Central Parks. So Central Park is a big piece of land in New York City. It has very little ecological value, but it's an incredibly important psychological um, space. But if you put the, those 700,000 Central Parks together, you have an incredible resource. In fact, you have a, a, a what we call a, in landscape, a, 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 a landscape corridor that would wrap around the planet almost 70 times. So my argument is if the 196 nations of the world want to achieve connectivity, they do have the political and material resource of the extra 1.6% that we need to meet the 17% target under Aichi target number 11. And with that resource, we can achieve landscape connectivity on a planetary scale. If people became serious about achieving connectivity, and engaged in the design and planning problem of renegotiating land use between all of the fragments in the archipelago that I've shown you. What is interesting is that this is not just um, idealism. All over the world, NGOs, communities, and governments are engaging in large scale landscape connectivity projects and other projects, carbon sinks, um, catchment, restoration, riparian corridor, reconstruction, massive, there is a massive new breed of what I call mega eco projects. The 20, 19th and 20th century was an age of engineering mega projects, many of which failed and were dangerous and destructive. We are now moving into a new era of what I call mega eco projects, many of which might, might run into the same problems as the mega projects that preceded them. But it's interesting that this is actually happening and what is really interesting, I think, is that human beings are engaging with design and planning and managing landscapes at a planetary scale, more or less for the first time in history. Although you could argue that indigenous peoples the world over for, for millennia have managed their landscapes in this manner. But for us, for us to become self-conscious about reconstructing and designing ecologies at a planetary scale in alliance with the conservation community and so on, I think is an extraordinary turn of events. So what you see on this world map are all the projects that are either, either happening or being planned and negotiated as we speak. If we turn to representation, as I said, the problem is the nature, the ad hoc nature of the um, fragments of protected areas, which you could see as green, small green areas on this world map. What I would like to draw your attention to on this world map is not the the collection of fragments, the archipelago, but the, the beige or the brown colored areas, which are the world's biological hotspots. There are 36 of these regions and you can see them marked on the map. And from a biological perspective, they are the most important territories because it's in those territories that you have the wealth of, the, of evolution's genetic creativity. In other words, those brown areas from a planetary biological perspective are exactly what libraries are to culture. So as you, if we, if we bulldoze and burn down the, the, the landscapes in these biological hotspots, it is akin to destroying the libraries in terms of culture. So my research has focused as a matter of priority on these biological hotspots. And one of the driving forces of, or one of the defining features of hotspots, the way a hotspot is classified and recognized is that it has utterly irreplaceable species within it, and those species are threatened with imminent extinction. So these are, these are crisis areas, basically. And um, I have tried to bring design and urbanism into the conservation conser um, 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 conserva um, conversation about how to manage these regions, because I think it's a design problem, not just a, a conservation problem. So my, the four questions that I've been approaching in my work over the last decade at least is how can, we achieve, how can we enhance biological representation in these territories? How can we achieve landscape connectivity across scale? How can we deal with the conflicts between urbanization and biodiversity? And finally, how can we design a more symbiotic world between urbanization and conservation? The first project I will very, very quickly show you is titled The World Park. I wish I had a better name for this project, but that's where it's, that's what it's become. This is a, um, a very big idea. And 
uh, concerns uh, the, the, the design question, if I can put it that way, of how to connect the world's biological hotspots into a coherent system that is not an archipelago of fragments. And so you can start drawing lines on a map that connect up the biological hotspots. The first one you see in red on the left there runs from Alaska down to Patagonia and does quite a bit of work in terms of connecting a series of hotspots. Another could be drawn from Namibia up into um, Central Asia or Turkey. And another could be drawn from the south of Australia up the east coast through Central Asia and across Europe into the top of North Africa. Now, with those three lines, they constitute the catalytic beginnings of what I'm referring to as a world park. These are very simple. These lines are translated into reality. They are literally walking trails, simple, relatively cheap infrastructure that enables people to engage with these territories. But the lines themselves become armatures for the project of the world park, which is ecological restoration of all of the denuded territory in between the protected areas that you find in those regions. So I will just zoom you into one example of this, which is what we call the Patasca Trail running from Alaska in the left of the image all the way down to Patagonia. And you can see the dark green areas are the protected areas. And the red line, the very thin red line that you can see making its way throughout all that territory does the work of threading the needle and connecting these protected areas. And in a sense, it invites people out into those landscapes, not just to enjoy the, 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 the picturesque and scenic qualities of protected areas, the beauties of nature. No, 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 not that at all. The real mission of this idea is that it engages people with the, with the denuded landscapes in between the protected areas. So if I zoom you in a little bit further, you can see what I'm talking about. The real attention of the idea of the World Park is those areas in between all of the fragments. And that becomes a question of labour and economics and mobilising large numbers of, let's say, young people to get out into that territory, not just to, to, to walk and enjoy the reverie of landscape, but to get out there and actually work on the project of ecological restoration in synchrony with the beginning of this decade of ecological restoration as championed by the United Nations. I wanna turn now to the urban question and this map should frighten everybody. As I've said to you, the biological hotspots, the 36 of them, which you now see in green on this world map are the most valuable from, a, from an ecological genetic perspective. Every yellow dot that you see on this map is a city defined by the United, United Nations as 300,000 people or more. And we have mapped and analyzed these cities and forecast their growth. Initially, we did it to 2030. We've now done it out to 2050 using Karen Sito's data from Yale. And we've um, superimposed in mapping of endangered species ranges with these growth forecasts for all of the cities of 300,000 people or more in the world's biological hotspots. That's some 423 cities. And out of that 423 set, over 90%, in fact, 383 of those cities are rapidly expanding, i.e. sprawling into habitat that harbours endangered species. So what you see in this map is a global calamity and it is happening every day. It is happening rapidly and it is largely happening in parts of the world which are, let's say, outside the big centres of design culture and urban design interests and the commercial world of neoliberal design production. So the question I've been asking is how can you, through design, prevent the further sprawl of cities that is destructive of these habitats. That is the design problem. That is not a fait accompli. It is a design and planning and political problem. It's a creative challenge. To manage that challenge, we've reduced the sample set of 423 that we initially began with down to um, a set of 33 cities in the world's biological hotspots. And these are what I call the hotspot capitals. They are the biggest and fastest growing of the sample set of cities that we began with. And we've now, since we've been, what we've been doing now is trying to drill down to a design scale and conduct case studies in various, in, in these different cities. Not all of them, 
although we have held symposiums where we bring representatives of these cities together here at Penn to discuss this problem, we're really using a lot of our design studios to focus on these red points that you see on the map, which I call the hotspot capitals. The mapping of these cities, which is currently on display in the Biennale um, as one of the parts of the exhibit that I have there, on the map, the mapping of these cities that we've done everywhere, it's a bit hard to see at this scale, but everywhere where you see red basically indicates areas where few, the future expansion, predicted expansion of these cities um, by extrapolation of their current behaviour is in direct conflict with endangered uh, species. I want to make the point briefly about urban design history and just draw an arc from something that many of you will remember or, or appreciate, but the original Interrotta in 79 was, you know, an important a landmark event in urban design history, post-modern urban design history. And it focused primarily on the inner city region of Rome. And I want to draw an arc from there to the more recent event, which occurred in um, a few years ago. And the scale of Rome in this case is I've put I've drawn a red square onto the map, which was the subject area of this update of the Interrotta, so almost 30 years later, um, which focused on the periurban. And it, it's my belief and my contention that that is an important turn of events, that the important areas now are actually happening, the important issues are at the edges of our cities, not in the inner city parts of our cities, where most of the design dollars have been, have been spent over the last 30 years, and most of design discourse and design attention has taken place there. So having said that, I want to, um, there are two forms of peri-urban expansion that are problematic and you need different tools, different methods and different approaches in each of these instances. The first example on the left is from a, is, is Perth. Um, as an exemplar of a planned economy, uh, essentially with a good planning system, this is on the west coast of Australia in a biological hotspot and I've done a lot of work there on um, developing methods and scenarios by which you can influence the planning of a city so that its sprawl does not do what you see is happening on that image. That is suburban sprawl directly ploughing into some of the world's most valuable biological heritage. Um, and as I said before, that is not a fait accompli, it can be redirected by design. On the right hand side of the image, of course, you see another form of urbanisation, which is the informal sector where cities have been growing uh, are sprawling not by centrally planned economies, but by individuals simply building communities. In this case, Bogota, uh, the capital of Colombia. Um, and so the question is, can you develop design methods that broach both of these urban sprawling phenomena? The first case study in the case of Perth, the red areas are areas where you, we have identified as predicted conflict between endangered species and urban growth out to 2050. And what do we do? Well, we try to develop a comprehensive structural green plan for a city so that the developers can be told, well, you can work in the white areas, but you, and you have to pay for the reconstruction of the green areas. The green areas on this very didactic map are areas that need to be preserved, protected from a biological perspective, but also reconnected so that you form a coherent structural system of green infrastructure, and then the city is backfilled into that. That gives the development community certainty, and it gives the planning community certainty in terms of the forward planning of the city. I show you this image of, of, of actually going so far as to then project urban form, and I show you this image because I want to, want to be very clear that I'm not talking about a kind of romantic um, return to some sort of medieval urbanism and, and, and any kind of romance of, of biology or conservation. I think that the industrial, residential, agricultural and environmental systems are, need to be robustly interwoven with one another to create new forms of urbanization that are, that are not romantic, in fact. They are all systematic and, and can be um, designed at such and designed and planned at, at a scale that is commensurate with the crisis. Turning now to Bogota, we've done a lot of work. This is a different example of inform largely informal growth, although Bogota does have a centrally planned economy as well. Again, the city of Bogota is in the middle of all of that red that you see on this map. The red area is predicted out to 2050 conflict between urban growth and endangered species. So it's calamitous. It's uh, awfully, cities are awfully violent and destructive, and this can be 
prevented. Bogota's problem is, you see Bogota as the gray area on this map um, with a red line around it. Bogota's problem, and the green areas are of course, fragmented protected areas that have increasingly little biological value unless they are connected into a larger coherent system. Through the middle is the Rio Bogota, a river that is basically dead. Um, and so that riparian corridor through the middle of of this region needs to be restored. The protected areas need to be reconnected. And you need to do that before the city of Bogota just grows. Now, Bogota, like the city of Perth, they are both predicted to double in their population by 2050. Bogota is currently about 9 million people. It could go out to 15 million by, by 2050, but who really knows because much of it is informal. Bogota's problem is it has nowhere to grow except into its own food bowl, the Savannah de Bogota, which is on the left-hand side of the image of the existing city inside the green dashed line is the Savannah de Bogota. Beautiful, incredible food bowl right next to the city. And the city has no choice but to sprawl into that area. And that's what's happening. But it's not happening by design. We've done a lot of work on trying to create a coherent green infrastructural system that stitches together the remaining fragments of protected areas that restores the, the riparian corridor through the middle, but in a non-romantic way is also preparing for rapid urbanization. Urbanization can be backfilled into this green superstructure. So that's what this drawing shows is urbanization for another four or five million people, a second airport, a coherent transportation system, treating urbanism as an ecosystem and as an absolutely legitimate part of the ecosystem. And then what we do is we put the urban and the ecological together into a kind of a synthesis. Um, and, and in this case, you see that the, the two have been put together, which facilitates the future growth of these, this city and leverages that growth to also reconstruct the ecology of the region of the city. And in that way, returning back to the beginning of my presentation, here at an urban scale, we can demonstrate through design that it is possible through planning and design to create a more symbiotic world. Okay, I think I've said enough. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll hand back to the panel. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, thank you. I think uh, you raised a lot of uh, important issues and points. I think we will discuss further into the, in the, in the in the discussion. And I think, you know, one of the question is how do we put the, the pieces back together, the fragments back together? And if we do, how this is also a design problem. And I think this is something that, uh, you know, also the, the other presentations uh, would expand on, but also we can go back and, and talk about this more in detail, I think during the presentation. So thank you, thanks again. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker, Sarah Williams. Sarah Williams is an associate professor of technology and urban planning at MIT. And she's also the director of the Leventhal Center of Advanced Urbanism and Civic Data Design Lab at MIT. Sarah will present data action. Big data can be used for good from tracking disease to exposing human rights violation and for bad, implementing surveillance and control. Data inevitably represents data ideologies of those who control its use. Data analytics and algorithms too often exclude women, the poor, and ethnic groups. In Data Action, Sarah Williams provides a guide for working with data in more ethical and responsible ways. Williams outlined a method that emphasized collaboration among data scientists, policy experts, data designers, and the public. The approach generates policy debates, influences civic decision, and informs design to help ensure that the voice of people represented in the data are neither marginalized nor left unheard. Sarah Williams is an associate professor of technology and urban planning at MIT, and, uh, and she directs the CV Data Design Lab at in the Leventhal Center of, uh, for Advanced Urbanism. Williams combined her training in computation and design to create communication strategies that expose urban policy issues to broad audiences and create civic change. She calls the process data action, which is also the name of a recent book published by MIT Press. Williams is the co-founder and developer of Envelope City, 
a web-based software product that visualizes and allows users to modify zoning in New York City. Before coming to MIT, Williams was co-director of the Special Information Design Lab at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Her design work has been widely exhibited, including work in the Guggenheim, the Museum of Modern Art, Venice Biennale, and the Cooper Ubit. Williams has won numerous awards, including being named one of the top 25 technology planners and game changer by Metropolis Magazine. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, thanks so much for inviting me today. Um, <clears throat> very happy to participate in this conversation. Um, so um, I am Associate Professor of Technology and Urban Planning as um, just introduced. And I also direct the Leventhal Center for Advanced Urbanism, which is a cross disciplinary center, which combines the research of architecture, urban planning, landscape architecture and systems thinking not about the problems of yesterday, um, but of the future. Um, and we are motivated by radical changes in our environment and the role that design and research can play in addressing those. I myself am very interdisciplinary. I combined training in computation and design to create communication strategies that expose urban policy issues to broad audiences to create civic change. And it's the topic of my most recent book and the topic um, that I'd like to discuss today with you all. Um, data action sets out to remind us that big data in its wrong form cannot perform on its own. Rather, how data is transformed and operationalized can change the way the see, we see the world. More specifically, data can be used for civic action and policy change by communicating the data clearly and responsibly to expose hidden patterns and ideologies to audiences inside and outside the policy arena. Communicating with data in this way requires the ability to ask the right questions, find or collect the appropriate data analyze and interpret the data and visualize the results in a way that can be understood by broad audiences. Combining these methods transforms data from a simple point on a map to a narrative that has meaning, just as we saw in the, the previous uh, presentation. Data is not often processed in this way because data analysts are not familiar with the techniques that can be used to tell stories with data ethically and responsibly, and data action seeks to provide that guidance. In the book, I lay out seven data action principles, uh, one of which I thought was particularly relevant to what we were discussing today. The fourth principle, um, which calls us to expose hidden systems, um, really, addresses the fact that we need to come up with unique ways to acquire, quantify, and model um, data that can expose messages previously hidden from the public. I'm going to show an example of that work today. And I think what's important about this is in some countries where data is tightly controlled, by the government who produces it, privately owned data is the only data that exists to analyze the dynamics of our life. Um, the third chapter of my book, Hack It, argues that we ought to be creative in the ways that we obtain data to answer important questions about society, nonetheless acknowledging that data acquired for one purpose and applied towards another holds numerous ethical concerns that must be considered. Um, here I use an example of a project that I worked on in China called Ghost Cities. If you're not familiar with the phenomena on ghost cities, these are developments that have been built in China but largely lie vacant. Um, mapping these vacant residential developments can identify risk in the Chinese real estate market. 
Um, and this is really important because um, vacant developments um, really drive the economy in China. But finding information about where these vacant developments exist is not available um, even to the average urban planner. So I decided to create a model um, using data openly available from Chinese Yelp to try to identify where these ghost cities exist. Scraping this data, um, the model is based off the premise that thriving communities need amenities, a mall, a grocery store, a place to eat, uh, a place to get your hair cut. In this example, we're showing those data scraped from Damping. Um, and then we also scraped residential locations from AMAP and Baidu and created a grid of all the residential locations. Then what we did is measure how far a residential grid location is to a particular amenity, taking into account that some amenities might not actually be visited. So we looked at the reviews to see if people actually went to those locations. We took this measurement and applied the Hansen's gravitational model that measures urban accessibility, which takes into the account that if you live further from the city center, you'd be willing to travel further to an amenity. We calculated an amenity score for all of the um, residential cells, and then we um, removed those uh, ones below the mean. Um, then taking these high amenity scores, we performed spatial autocorrelation on the cells that remained, saying that if there's a clustering of cells, those are most likely a ghost city. One of the things that's really important to the data action methodology is ground truthing. And when I talk about ground truthing, I mean actually going to see it on the ground, but asking those uh, who are affected by the situation whether what I found holds true. Um, so we went to Chengdu, Tianjin, and Xi'an uh, to ground truth our findings. So uh, to give you an example of some of the types of things that we identified, um, in Xi'an, um, we found many developments that looked like this. Um, a development that uh, was built uh, five to 10 years. Um, and the Chinese government would argue that eventually this development will be completely sold. It's okay that it's not sold now because the costs and jobs that it creates to produce is more benefit to them than to actually selling the real estate. Um, and so these are more one-off developments. We also found developments that look like this, um, let's say undeveloped sites next to semi-occupied housing. So in this particular case, we're looking at a housing project and it is semi-occupied, um, but it's occupied mostly with the people who lived in the village before this development was produced. Um, the Chinese government does give villagers um, access to these housing. I should stop and take note that in some cases, these vacant developments were completely sold. Um, just nobody lived there. And I think this is a phenomenon that we know quite well that's been exported from China to all over the world. Um, Chinese citizens tend to own four to five houses as a way um, to invest their funds. This was really important before uh, the Chinese stock market existed and it was the only way, um, but has created a kind of mechanism uh, in which these vacant developments are extremely common. Um, we also found, um, let's say vacant formal communist housing um, ready for redevelopment um, and um, rehabilitation and um, whole cities um, 
this one just outside of Xi'an um, that was um, built, kind of in partially built is the best way to explain this, but never inhabited. This was meant to be uh, the science center um, in this, let's say, satellite city. So once um, we made the maps uh, for each city, we created a data visualization that we could show people in China to understand the model behind the data. So we wanted to ask them whether our findings rang true, but also at the same time, give them a way to understand how the model worked and what parameters made each cell a ghost city. So when you click on each cell, it tells you um, the distances that were given to make that particular um, city um, uh, or particular cell um, have a high amenity score. So here we can see uh, these have low amenity scores because they're close to many different amenities that you would want uh, to see. Um, and we took this data visualization and we brought it to um, planners, uh, senior planners um, here talking from the Chinese Academy of Urban Planning and Design. And she really talked about how vacant developments are controversial to local politics. And I think what's interesting is that the visualizations really allowed us to have broader conversations um, and really many Chinese planners are very tight lipped about uh, development processes. Um, and we were able to learn that these planners aren't given a lot of ability to decide where these developments are and they're not using data, but rather um, are developed based on what's coming from the top of the government. But I think what's really interesting is the real estate developers um, helped explain that the burst of the real estate bubble will carry irreversible impacts on residents who buy houses with mortgages. And one of the things that this developer told us is that um, in many ways, this development pattern is a bit of a Ponzi scheme because the bank and the government are the same thing in China. So what happens is oftentimes the government opens up land for development. Um, the developer can't sell all the property. So the bank needs the money back. Uh, so the government opens up another piece of land to get a loan to pay back the previous one. And it continues uh, along in that process. Uh, we spoke to academics who talked about the mismatch between supply and demand geospatially being a big problem um, and addressing the oversupply is really looming ahead. Ultimately, we created a map, what I would consider um, identifying the foreclosure crisis uh, before it happens in China. And we brought this work to broad publics um, that we do in all of our projects to not just communicate this to the planners and real estate developers and academics, but also so others understand that phenomenon. And here uh, you're looking at an exhibition in Seoul that was then connected um, to drone imagery that we took at the site when we were ground truthing. So, um, the fifth chapter of my book reminds us that rapidly growing data landscape, there is a growing divide between the people who have access to data and those who do not. And while data was once something that only landowners and governments controlled, now private companies are accumulating exponential amounts of data every day, which gives them the power once held solely by governments. Some believe this amounts to data colonialism where private companies extract our data as a resource and use it as a tool of control. Uh, putting the idea of data colonialism aside for a moment, I believe it's important to think of data as a public good, a non-rivalous commodity that can be valued by all that consume it, a commodity similar to electricity, which needs regulation so that can be used equitably by the public. 
Um, and really, how can we use um, big data uh, for a public good? Um, and one of the things that people often don't realize is that Africa is a continent of missing data. Fewer than half births are recorded and some countries have not taken a census in years. Um, the World Bank calls it a, a really problem, a foundational problem because the needs of those not represented in the data are not being met um, and um, cause it a deprivation that needs to be solved. So much so that the uh, sustainable development goals made data part of each goal um, and collecting and building data. But what's interesting is that the data actually exists. It exists in the hands of Facebook or Google, among others. And I really set out to ask, can we turn this data into something that is valuable to society. Um, so in a recent project, I worked uh, with Facebook, which is the most used website in Kenya to access their data on connectivity. Um, and so this is just uh, an example of all uh, kind of a screenshot of Facebook data. We took numerous data sets they have about users per capita, carrier diversity, signal length, sample uh, per user um, to create a Nairobi connectivity indicator, which would allow us to understand how connected people are to the internet. Part of that then connectivity index needs to be combined with a demand based on land use, um, but we didn't have data, land use data and so we decided to try to create that data ourselves um, by scraping it uh, from Google Maps. Uh, what we used was uh, a method where we sent latitude and longitude uh, points uh, to Google Maps, which then extracted um, place data, which also give us information about the name, the location, um, the ratings and the reviews, as well as photos on a number of different services, much the same way that we had done in Damping um, for the Chinese ghost cities. We created a place density and diversity index from that data, and then also uh, ran uh, the images through uh, image processing to identify different land use types. Um, ultimately, this allowed us to create a land use map of the city that we connected with the Facebook data to create an internet demand map. Um, it's not surprising that these red cells for internet demand are in some of the poorest locations in Nairobi. We then uh, applied the index to Kampala, um, and then ultimately uh, a number of different cities in Africa. And then we thought, how could we use this data to create um, uh, infrastructure ourselves um, and a social infrastructure, which we know internet is extremely important right now. Um, and given I'm close to up to time, I'll just tell you a little bit about this most recent project that took that map data and created something that we are calling a living data hubs, which is a co-designed wireless network and data collection tool that is in Kibera, uh, Nairo one of Nairobi's largest uh, informal settlements. Um, and working with Kinkui Design Initiative, we've installed now uh, wireless mesh network in four of their public spaces. Um, and we just did this a few weeks ago. So I'm kind of showing you some of the images of um, uh, these uh, public space um, owners and them actually installing and managing um, the system. The wireless hotspots include um, an environmental sensor which is then um, per given, the data is given on the phones of individuals. 
And I look forward to developing this project that came out of using uh, a resource that I was able to translate and synthesize into something um, that has a public good. Data action, um, I hope you understand the data action methodology. And I think how it's really important here is that when we're looking at different kinds of systems and particularly the systems that were discussed in the previous talk, a lot of the data doesn't exist. And how can we exploit some of these resources to really identify the needs in those areas? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sarah, for your very amazing, insightful lecture. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jörg Schröder. Um, Jörg Schröder is um, professor and chair for territorial design and uh, urban planning, as well as director of the Institute of Urban Design and Planning of Leibniz University Hanover in Germany, where I had also the honor to work for eight years. Um, his research interests focus on urbanism and architecture for territorial innovation and sustainability, as well as on a research by design approach on metropolitan areas and peripheries, emerging creative habitats and circular dynamics. Uh, its recent, recent research and development project include uh, Rurbans, and European Alpine Space Program, Regio Branding, and Creative Food Cycles, uh, a recently concluded European project in the framework of Creative Europe Program. He organized international conferences, workshops, and exhibitions in Germany, in Italy, Austria, Switzerland, and Spain. In 2010, he was also invited to the exhibition of the German Pavilion at the Venice uh, Biennale. Um, today, Jörg Schroeder is going to present us his lecture with the title New Bauhaus City Rediscovering Territories. And uh, I would like to give him the floor to introduce his lecture. Thanks a lot, uh, Jörg Schroeder, for being with us today. <clears throat> Many thanks, Emanuele, for the introduction and Many thanks to you all in New York, Genova, and wherever. It's, uh, it's a really nice opportunity to, uh, to discuss and to hear um, contributions to this really interesting topic that you have chosen. Well, and I try to contribute something different from the others, not in order to have some contrasts. Hmm. Um, okay. <clears throat> It works, no? Good. Yes. Very well. Um, the title, no? New about City, Rediscovering Territories, um, points at two important debates we are currently having in Europe. <clears throat> On the one hand, there's the initiative of the New European Bauhaus that I will explain a little bit later. That, uh, uh, that is currently moving no? a lot of exchange, not only in the academic world, but especially in politics and in society. And um, <clears throat> on the other hand, the rediscovering of territories, what means for me <laughs> dimensions outside of metropolis, is a thing that, that really started with the COVID pandemic and um, I think, you know, <clears throat> together with many others, will be one of the things that, that uh, let's say, spreads then out. Um, what we are currently doing um, is running a master design studio and a research project with the title New Bauhaus City. Um, the reason is simply you know, that we as urbanists logically say you no know, that that city is not only the main platform for reaching sustainability and really implementing the green deal but that the city itself can become a tool you now to achieve these goals and um, <clears throat> consequently you know we we are working in creative research um, for places beyond metropolis that contributes to this initiative that explores places, that explores recent phenomena, 
And let's say that tries to find out how design can uh, contribute towards resilient communities and towards the cultural change that, that we will need um, in the Green Deal. And to introduce no, for this phenomenon, discovering outside of peripheries no, that last year, Germany was the top um, tourism country of Europe. What is normally a position held by Spain, France, and Italy, you know? <clears throat> and we were all very surprised. And the reason is simply you know, that last year, everybody could only make travels really near to the places where they were living or almost a national scale. You know? And obviously Germans traveled quite a lot, even last year. You know? And they discovered a lot of places you know, that they neglected before because in holidays, they always went to Bahamas, or I don't know. No? This is a very interesting phenomenon, no? and regards not only, let's say, the um, spectacular places near to the Alps, um, but also places really near to metropolis, what this photo near Marseille from the Calog um, illustrates, no? that this tourism of proximity, where you would say, it's fantastic, um, um, uh, it saves even CO2 no, for the long travels. It rediscovered uh, regional values. It contributes to sustainability, maybe, but it caused also really serious problems, no? not only in traffic, but in the environmental impact in these areas, in local communities, um, and, and uh, no, sometimes triplicated guest numbers. No? On the other hand, really, let's say, um, new possibilities have been discovered. No? Children can go to school even um, really far up in the Alps, no? that, that, uh, at least for certain times. On the other hand, no? the problems of isolation that we all know um, have been highlighted. And uh, we saw cities with completely new eyes, no? like in this uh, photo from Paris. And um, uh, density, has become a threat in certain times, no? And uh, pollution uh, went down. Uh, so let's say we learned also quite a lot of the cities um, in, in this, let's say, play or dialogue with outside of the big metropolises. And basically, no, <clears throat> this move for weekends or for some days off uh, didn't stop with that. No, many people really went out of the city to live there. And I just show some uh, articles and pictures from the newspaper of Munich, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, no, that last year was really quite systematically, no, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not doing the data analysis, no, but um, qualitatively, there have been really many contributions about this phenomena following people that, that really from very different backgrounds, also from migration backgrounds, um, these discovered these places outside of metropolis, also from different ages, no? So also contributions in, in special, special journals for young people, no? That question, is this really good? Do I lose uh, the parties and my mates in the big city? How should it work? No, and it's different for people with small children and for elderly. And um, let's say all these different social groups have been addressed. No, and <clears throat> at the same time, we became again aware that the situations are really different. No, for example, in the Alps, um, there are certainly also in the Alps there are cities no, that are growing, and there are also peripheral areas that are growing and that are battling really with uh, suburbanization phenomena, with um, um, impact on, on environment and other areas in blue. Now that many in since long times are losing populations, are uh, getting overaged, are losing economic uh, perspectives. Now, so let's say this move outside of the city um, met now a really very disparate and different situation. Um, and um, probably all of you know, know this, this night images of Europe that illustrate quite well <clears throat> what happened in the last 20 years, the phenomenon of metropolisation that covers, for example, the Pianura Padana or Belgium and Southern Netherlands, um, 
or the extension of Berlin. You no, know? and on the other side, the dark areas. You no, know? and maybe to highlight the most prominent one, um, the the vacant Spain. That is also the topic of the the Biennale in Spain this year, <clears throat> um, and uh, very much discussed. You no, know? and uh, uh, let's say this this two phenomena. You no, know, that in this light might maybe seem separated. Extension of the metropolitan regions beyond the metropolitan regions and on the other side the, the dark sides in in uh, effectively are intertwined in uh, in many senses and uh, this this overlaying is even increasing no? um, it's very impressive in numbers no since many times looking at let's say global discussions about mega cities and urbanization um, we believe also Europe is becoming one big city. Effectively, it's not. No, if you zoom in a bit and really look at the places where people live, only 40% of Europeans are living in cities that are larger than 50,000 inhabitants. And even one third is living in places that is smaller than 5,000 inhabitants. Maybe in different locations, no? maybe really more in metropolitan grids. Um, or in very peripheral situations, no? but effectively it's the context of the communities no? that count for the qualities of living <clears throat> and for the perspectives no? of people. At the same time, the polarization between the metropolises and the periphery has become a major political topic. Since many years already, these images I show you are from the um, decision in 2005 in France about the European constitution. And already then phenomena that followed later, no, like the um, Gilo um, the, the rise of the Rassemblement National and the threat that Marine Le Pen becomes the next president of France, no, originated in deep polarities um, between metropolitan centers and peripheries in many senses that are urban peripheries neglected suburban areas, small towns and cities, um, rural areas, remote areas, no? And they have been systematically neglected for long years. And, uh, in, and it's not only in Spain, in France, in Germany, also in Italy and almost all European countries, we are having this discussion about polarization. In this situation, let's say we, we try to do some research and um, that's a very important book. Uh, we did three years ago together with Maurizio Carter um, and the University of Palermo um, with the main aim to discover new phenomena outside of metropolis that, that can give impulses to positive um, development that can become examples for emerging creative resilient habitats. No? So this book is a big collection of examples, but also a discussion. And I want very briefly to outline you, not the examples, these you can look up and there are many, um, but the conceptual framework. No? And basically we we faced the argumentation no? um, based on a multiple sense of dynamics <clears throat> Now that, that includes not only new economic possibilities and um, also investments no, that, that go from the cities in these areas that are maybe created in new collective modes and um, shared economy, um, but also certainly no, dynamics in social sense, <clears throat> um, dynamics of nature, and dynamics in a spatial sense, um, making use of existing cultural foundations and in the end also um, of existing buildings, no? because those are important resources in terms of climate change. And let's say our argumentation was no? that, that uh, really in a perspective of resilience, resilience may even be reached more easily um, in these places because of uh, um, tighter connection to nature, um, because communities can easier, more easily be motivated, can be organized, no? they can even become reserves of resilience, 
and let's say in the bigger game can contribute um, for the resilience of the large metropolitan areas. No? And let's say this provides and is also based <clears throat> on a new attractivity um, as places to live. No? So a perspective for outside of metropolis, not anymore only in terms of uh, a neglected or in terms of agriculture or in terms of tourism, what have been the three major debates no, that we all know, but really as places of living and as places to, to establish new communities in, in, in a habitat vision that includes not only human beings, but also the natural. Um, and let's say linked no, with what we call territorial creativity. Um, uh, this means not the systematic digging up <clears throat> of, um, of social capital, of spatial capital, of natural capital, um, and, and the, the, the setup no, of creative models um, to use all these factors. No? And let's say that's a bit the galaxy. No? We build, um, and uh, uh, let's say I want just to, to mention no, important, let's say, strategic aspect and also tools that regard enabling of communities, the facilitating of spatial agencies, creating of new linkages between <clears throat> peripheries and metropolises, or new working and living models, no? what we now all know, <laughs> that are deeply bound to digitalization, also multi-place living, they, they have set up of new communities in the periphery. Um, and and um, let's say also the, the big issue of adoption, no? what we are in these days actually are facing in Germany, no? we are having big floods. That, that really cost lives, no? That's, uh, it's almost incredible what's, what's happening, no? And so the impact of climate change is super clear. Well, <clears throat> from, from a conceptual um, operative point of view, no? we formulated in the book three ways of access, no? That, uh, that uh, may also direct further research. And in, in one, level no we are very interested in in uh, processes of transition how existing um, examples worked and work um, um, what can be distilled no in in like uh, as engines of this transition what parameters they can learn we are very interested in in methods um, to evaluate the potentialities of places in, in a really comprehensive way <clears throat> that includes factors. And we are super interested in creative narratives because we believe that, that narratives um, in a double sense, no? in, in one thing really to grasp voices, to give uh, voices a stage <clears throat> um, that come really from individual backgrounds, from experiences, and, and uh, let's say more or less in the same move, no, to, to use multiple narratives in, in trying to combine, to create shared visions, no, what we will have to do for the, for the transition and climate change. <clears throat> and these narratives have to be appealing, um, but also inclusive. And, uh, uh, I think now that, that the, the great effect or and the aspect of design <clears throat> can play a major role in this, no? And um, well, maybe to illustrate a bit, bit um, of our research background where we try to, to use no, certain of these tools. Um, it's for example, no, to in the move from policy analysis <clears throat> to new strategic frameworks. That's, uh, that's, for example, a policy evaluation we did for a region um, in South Germany <clears throat> um, uh, about policies impacting local development <clears throat> that are really complex and that are deeply interlinked also, no? <clears throat> or the impact um, of the, let's say, bigger economic happenings that, that we are having, for example, the blue banana and its impact in the alpine space. <clears throat> For example, in the Trentino-Bolzano area, no? um, and let's say 
certainly you know, a topic we are following since a long time that, that now is super actual for everybody um, <clears throat> is uh, climate change in the Anthropocene. That let's say, and now I'm coming to five, four or five comments no, about this new European Bauhaus that are the basis no, for the uh, policy, um, main policy goal of the European Green Deal that has been set up by the new commission 2019. And last year, <clears throat> the president of the commission started herself, started the initiative uh, of the new European Bauhaus um, that uh, exactly in October 2020 and released it as part of the European Green Deal. And then now this year, um, the new European Bauhaus has become also part of the European Union's recovery plan, recovery and resilience plan. No? And uh, let's say it's connected to it. It's not a central policy, no? like, uh, like uh, digitalization, ecologization, and so on. Um, but it's connected to it. No? And, uh, let's say many historians and romantics no, may have criticized, uh, I should this term Bauhaus be used? Is, this, is it maybe excluding? Um, is it the wrong reference? And uh, let's say, basically, I like it that, that these topics are addressed in Brussels and um, are spread. And I like also this conflictual debate. No? And I think this, this big idea, no, like Bauhaus had to face really um, the, the big industrialization, the post-war situation in the 20s, um, new possibilities for, for coal, steel, and concrete with a really new cultural paradigm. Um, it's a nice reference in my regard, no? And, but we should think carefully um, what to make out of it, no? And just to report some of the basic points, no, that, uh, that uh, are addressed, that let's say that's the fundament, no? That 40% of CO2 emissions in Europe are caused by buildings, by, by building buildings, by running them and by destroying them, no? And this is a major field, no? That is attacked by many sectors <clears throat> and, Topics are, for example, renewable materials, but also affordability, you know, to make the Green Deal possible for, for everybody and interdisciplinary approaches that we need for this. You know? And um, the, the very interesting thing you now that the new European Bauhaus really should become a cultural project for Europe. And what has begun as a political initiative from top down you know, now, has really spread. Many people are involved. And let's say this open approach, um, I think it worked quite well, you know, so that, that many national local initiatives are dealing with this topic and are interpreting it. And there are many controversies, you no? Know? But let's say this, this basis to attack the 40% and to attack it as a cultural project, you no, know, are shared. No, so uh, this worked. No, and also let's say this the aim no to combine sustainability with inclusiveness, and uh, the question of aesthetics in all this process um, um, is is a shared debate. No, the question for sure is how to do it. No, but uh, let's say this approach to go beyond pure infrastructures to go beyond pure engineering. And, and to consider the cultural dimension of this big transition, I think is a major achievement and we should make the best out of it. No? And uh, effectively, no, in the formulation of uh, von der Leyen, no, <clears throat> the new European Bauhaus is intended as a bridge between the world of science and technology and the world of art and culture. <clears throat> and this is particularly interesting for, for our faculties of architecture and urbanism. No? since this is describing exactly the, the problem also that we are all having. No, we are not part of the established scientific worlds. 
and we are doing fancy stuff and have to define ourselves in some way. Yeah? Well, and what's going on? Let's say that there was the initiative for a lot of debates, manifestations, conferences that are happening throughout uh, of Europe that are in some way um, also fed back now to uh, what they called a co-design process. Um, and there will be a first resume in some weeks. There will be started five uh, projects in the Horizon program for Lighthouse projects. <coughs> we are all very curious about this. <coughs> Um, that address, for example, natural building materials, energy efficiency, demographics, future-oriented mobility, and resource-efficient digital innovation. And there has also been um, a campaign for a Bauhaus Prize, where innovative projects could be submitted, and uh, this it will be decided end of the summer, I think. No, but I think the point are not the prizes, but the huge database. Of, of innovative projects now that people um, handed in, that, uh, that uh, I think we can use this database very well. I'm looking forward to it, no? Um, let's say the angle, uh, we would like to, to contribute more deeply in this context <clears throat> is the topic of circular city um, with the paradigms to, to be regenerative, no? So not only, let's say, to, to um, um, ob observe <clears throat> and not destroy, no? But actively to contribute to regeneration of nature, but also to, to regeneration of, of society and culture, to be accessible and to be abundant by design. What is one of the paradigms that's interesting me most, and I, uh, yes, I'm working on this. No, abundancy is really fantastic because it's contradictory to all <clears throat> romantic, systemic, industrialized thinking we are carrying around now, coming coming from the machine age, and um, let's say is really purposely looking <clears throat> for chaos. No, that that then can be used uh, in a good way um, to to face. Uh, the challenges we are, we are having. And um, uh, this, this uh, let's say, topic of the circular city <clears throat> can, uh, in the next years now, when, when we, we work on it, can be based on one project we did already that is called Creative Foot Cycles <clears throat> that Emmanuel already mentioned. And he was one of the most important persons in this project that ran um, the, the group in Hanover and um, contributed a lot that it worked between the three cities, Hanover, Barcelona, and Genova. No? So um, this was IAC in Barcelona and with the University of Genova <coughs> was the cooperation. And um, let's say the, the problem, I guess, is evident for everybody. No? <coughs> the amount of food waste we are having in Europe, 178 kilogram per year per person. And the, the impact of food production on climate gas emission <clears throat> that is uh, in Europe around 25%. No? So we are talking about a really crucial sector here no? and in the whole food economy. And our approach was <clears throat> now to look at this for once, not with an um, economic eyes um, <clears throat> and not, let's say, with an eyes uh, of natural sciences, but with a special creative approach, no? And, and to understand food cycles, on the one hand, as lens, to observe, to, to make manifest um, <clears throat> situations in cities, situations in society, and on the other hand, as possibly accelerator for urban change, no? So the setting up of new circular um, cultures and its manifestation in the cities to contribute to overall change. And let's say the approach then no, worked in a phasing from production, distribution, um, consumption to, to disposition, <clears throat> or better not. No? Um, and uh, let's say we developed a lot of research activities, um, a lot of uh, art, artistic activities <clears throat> around this, this cycle and in the locations of the three cities. And had um, as a scientific part, <clears throat> now a big symposium 
that let's say um, um, tried to to give some comprehensive uh, view and some comprehensive reasoning about this. And you can find it in this book, Creative Food Cycles Book One, <clears throat> that is for free since we received money from European Commission and open access on the on the homepage on Creative Food Cycles Org. <clears throat> and uh, it's nice. Um, what we are currently doing <clears throat> in the um, invited by Mose Ricci <clears throat> in the Academia Real in J um, as part of the Medways project that Mose Ricci is running. <clears throat> um, we are working about circular territories and um, in particular about three areas in the Mediterranean, in Puglia, in Eastern Sicily and in Andalusia um, for the, let's say, existing good examples in bioeconomy, they are, they are how, let's say, they depend on um, territorial systems, on, on um, social capital, um, on contexts, <coughs> um, especially on innovation facilitating contexts, no? and how um, innovative projects in bioeconomy could contribute to territorial innovation. No, so it's also a double-faced research that, that is partly analytical, partly more synthetical. And we are confronting the three areas. And for sure, it's also about, let's say, some reasoning for interregional um, um, results that could lead to cooperation or could lead, let's say, to policy advice, advice to, to a further level. Um, especially regarding the social and cultural aspects that, that we are in many points addressing in uh, urban design, urban planning, urbanism. Um, last year, we, we were lucky to get a funding, uh, a federal funding in Germany for a collaboration with uh, the University of Palermo, with Maurizio Carter. And the output was uh, this book <clears throat> that is super fresh. It's just now out in the bookstores called Cosmopolitan Habitat and um, bundles, uh, I think, important research we, we did in the last two and three years and also reflects impacts of uh, the COVID situation <clears throat> on urban planning. We presented it at the Barcelona Architecture Week this year. No, and let's say our idea is uh, in this combination no, of Cosmo, what means world, um, Politan, what means citizens, no, coming from the old Greek, and Habitat from Latin, living space. So it's, it's a very European medley. No? Um, and to bring this together <clears throat> with the question, why are cities the avant-garde in climate change? No? And effectively, they are. It's not only the C40 alliance, it's many of the most interesting projects no, that, that are started by cities, no? be it Milan, be it Barcelona, be it Paris, just to name the three most prominent in Europe that are running really interesting projects. No, no German city, I regret. <laughs> and let's say also in a worldwide scale, no? what, what you probably also know in the US, that really cities are in the avant-garde. No? And we ask a bit why, and we ask especially what can we learn for it and how can we use you now this focus on uh, <clears throat> um, being, being a citizen of a city and at the same time, let's say being a citizen of the world in terms of facing really global challenges and working on global challenges can give inputs to formulate a research agenda for urban resilience. No? Um, Right now, so this was the funding by the RD, many thanks. And we had, we had contributors from eight countries <clears throat> and um, in Europe and even from the US. And we saved 32 travels <clears throat> now because everything was digital. So this was a big contribution also to CO2 um, matters. And um, just no last point to, we organized the topic in, in uh, three levels that first addressed atmospheres, no? <clears throat> that, and, and let's say the innovative spirit of cities, how, how can it be made manifest, what may be connected to it? 
um, uh, what role you know do projects and do strategies play in this? Then about um, accelerators, no, that for sure is a topic that is more near to urban planning and design, no, like um, in the level of policies, but also in the very concrete level of places or of projects, no, <clears throat> that that can activate spaces and networks in the city. And let's say about the people running this, no, that uh, the cosmopolitan makers <clears throat> to, that are co-creating urban change. What are the mechanisms of this? <clears throat> what, what are possible models? <clears throat> and in the end, also how our professions change, no? What, what do we have to give our young graduates, no? That, that start and what do they need to, to work in this way? Okay. <clears throat> That's just some pictures, no? And we worked in parallel on Palermo and on places in Northern Germany, no? And confronted, let's say, existing initiatives, um, um, different topics that also, again, included food and food cycles in the cities. Um, <clears throat> and let's say the, the feedback loops, no? Between design and human engagement, no? And that's, that's a core message I show my, my students, no? that we can't remain stuck no? in this field of design. We, we have to move out no? in much more complex things. And without human engagement and human feedback, no? design in the future will be more or less meaningless. Yes, no, that's the table and the book is out and uh, have a look. I think it's nice. Um, well, that's it. And um, for sure, I'm, I'm not doing these books and projects alone. So I mentioned already Emanuele and we, we are a certain group no, at the University of Hanover. And I always uh, thank all of them. Very well. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you so much. And uh, we wanna thank everyone for, for the great presentations and uh, so we're very excited about the themes that have been raised. So I think we saw three very different presentations. And, uh, uh, and, but I think there is a, a very important common thread that I think we can now discuss and open up the discussion now. So we will uh, start with some questions from, from, from the moderators, from us, and then we will open up to the audience. So, um, so I will start with a more general questions, looking at the three presentations that uh, I think are very different from each other somehow, but, uh, but strongly connected. And, uh, and I think the three presentations have presented as a perspective that focuses on processes of both formation and action. Um, and uh, which I think both of them are important keywords as we think about the planetary scale all the way down to the, to the micro scale. And, uh, and I think at the same time, we have somehow, uh, as, we, uh, as we look at this interscalarity of processes and action, uh, we have the responsibility somehow to open up to new paths and processes that rely on uh, uh, codependency of systems. And I think this is also what we have seen in, uh, in the presentation in different forms. Um, the question, I think also that being raised at the beginning, how do we go back to, uh, how do we go, going back to the beginning, how do we put back the fragments? How do we put back the archipelagos together into, uh, into new or evolving habitats? And to what extent somehow this is a design problem? Uh, I think the two presentation also make us to reflect on the simultaneity of scales and, uh, and also addressing the, the issue of how we can inhabit, uh, you know, cities, territories, metropolitan regions, the planet, really through a holistic vision uh, that again, look at space cities and the whole planet as, as, a, connective, uh, as a connected expanded territory. And, uh, and I think, of course, this makes us to reflect how we design, how do we think, and how to operate. So in a way, I think this notion of codependency of system is, is very important. Um, I think we, we mentioned at the beginning uh, the, the relation about the terraforming, so how Earth system somehow is transformed to processes, also to anthropogenic processes. Uh, but also the relationship, I think, that we saw in the presentation between uh, geopolitics and technology 
and so how we can begin to think uh, at the the you know from the planetary scale to the architectural scale to the micro scale to geo I would say geo uh, techno geographies how we can uh, for how we can in a way look at the reproduction also in the age of planetary urbanization and what are the effects on the anthropogenic and this I think it's a very important uh, issue when we talk about archipelagos um, so. And this again, it's a question. This is just a premise, but it's a question to, to, to the speakers. So how do we see this process taking shape somehow now and in the future? And how uh, are these parameters, what are the parameters that we need to be aware and we need to take into consideration as architects, urbanists and designers? So this is open to the three speakers and uh, you know addressing some of the issues raised through the presentation, but also through the theme of the of the event. Um, it's a very it's a very big. I mean, I think your 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 remarks covered a lot of territory, and perhaps all three presentations together also covered a lot of territory. But maybe the answer to your question is is not that complicated. Um, my, my feeling is that if you, if you take a historical perspective, the Anthropocene occurs to us now as a design problem. And that is a, that is a kind of a paradigm shift. So the question becomes, how does, it, how does design culture respond to the realization of the Anthropocene? And the fundamental realization of the Anthropocene is, as you said, that we are, that nature is not a thing over there, that we are subjects of the earth system. And so that is a profound disorientation and reorientation for culture more broadly. And so, so the question becomes, how do you design in a way that resituates the human subject within that new context? And I think any, only a fool would say they know how to do that because it's, it's new. But we have, but on the other hand, there's lots of different sources of knowledge that we can pull together to um, recalibrate the design process. And I think, you, I think we, we see evidence of that everywhere, that design has to strive to um, be relational, to, to achieve um, multiple threads of connectivity, to engage with time and process, and perhaps circularity to an extent. Um, and I don't think it's a question of design as in necessarily what we used to call critical regionalism or trying to create a sense of place or genius loci. I think it's, it's, more, it's more difficult than those previous methods that we used to create places. Because I think the earth system is truly frightening and it's a sublime problem. So it's not a, it's not a straightforward, it's not something we can just jargon our way through or diagram our way out of. I would, I would simply say that it's, it's, it's a question of doing design in a way that is cognizant of the relationality between the exact place where you find yourself right now and the earth system and its frightening temporal and ecological dynamics. And that's something that can only be tested, not through platonic theory or abstraction, but through the agency of design. You have to design things and test, test things. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's a response. I mean, this is an open question somehow to really bring some issues to the table. I think, Richard, what you know, you talked about the peri-urban. I think that's also start to bring into the question where we design, and right. uh, and uh, not only how we design, but where where is the uh, in the Earth-like system? Where are we putting our focus? And I think that's also another question. And to me, it's not a question that is disconnected from from uh, uh, how do we design design, how do we design process of right. design and where. So everything somehow is interconnected and connected through processes, through scales and to, to larger systems. 
Uh, it doesn't mean that complexity doesn't mean action is the opposite. I think what we saw in Sarah's presentation is exactly this opposite, I think, is the fact that uh, how can we again bring action into the invisible somehow. And I think also in your presentation, again, how do we define boundaries of action, looking at periphery, looking at metropolitan region, but at the same time begin to connect back to what are the processes that affect formation. Well, just to follow up on that, one of the problems that I'm seeing a lot of is that there is a new generation of designers who are obviously not interested in just servicing the neoliberal city and everyone is chasing complicated systems and wants design to engage with real issues. And this is, this is obviously also the motivation in Europe behind the idea of a 21st century Bauhaus. The problem with designers chasing really complicated issues like biodiversity and all the other things we've seen today is that it tends to lead to an, kind of an abandonment of design, which worries me. It becomes, design becomes politics, design becomes sociology, design becomes anthropology, design becomes art. And, we, and, and I'm, I'm noticing that in the United States particularly. I mean, right now we're doing something called the Super Studio, which is about how do you, the question we've asked um, right across the nation, design schools, um, how do you translate the idealism and the politics of the Green New Deal into spatial practices? You know, we, we've just received 700 responses from schools right across the United States. And there is a remarkable absence of design. Um, and so that, that's my, I think that's a concern. Absolutely. Very, very interesting, this, uh, this discussion. I, I would like to continue. Um, I, to be really honest, I prepared some specific question and it was uh, guessing about uh, um, framing the different topics that you uh, would have present us today. And I was thinking that some of the question, considering the, <clears throat> the very inspiring lecture that you give us, uh, um, could share uh, also uh, some, let's say, some common uh, trends and some uh, common topics. And I would like to ask you as an open question, is still the accessibility be a driver of change for new economies, communities, uh, even in architecture? In, in, in an era also where global challenges and, and, and new augmented possibilities you know, that are rapidly, rapidly changing our perspective to perceive the territories and the way in which we inhabit it. I mean, it's, it's still the accessibility be um, a factor uh, that can be uh, drive the process of design. I, I, I I see this, especially considering the, the lecture of, of, of Richard about this eco corridors, uh, but also in a way of the connection to the accessibility to amenities where Sarah was introducing us, uh, but also the possibility of the different accessibility to peripheral territories and dynamic of peripheries by, by Jörg Schroeder. And I think like, um... In some ways, I want to talk about a bit about what Marcel says and what you said in that I think one thing that we don't realize is how little information we have on the Anthropocene and other kinds of archipelagos. And um, I think one, like if you're talking about accessibility, I think like one of the challenges that um, is important to remember um, is how to bring those issues to broader groups of people. And I think we hear about climate change, we understand sea level rise, but I think the communication strategies that are currently um, accessible um, are not something that we can take action with. Um, rather they're, um, I guess, you know, letting us know about climate change or letting us know about the issues um, of possible land use loss, but then are not then taking the next step, which allows um, some kind of action to be developed. Although I think Richard's work definitely showed some actionable things, but I think what's interesting about uh, some of the maps that he showed um, 
right, is we forget how much missing data is within, within those larger territorial frameworks and how do we bring, um, you know, like a lot of them are assumptions, aggregations, like, you know, made from interpol interpolations um, of other kinds of data sets and um, are not really getting down to some of the real needs that we have to make those design decisions. Well, um, this <clears throat> it's really a huge topic, no? And uh, I think Mar Marcella addressed really, really quite well, no possible crossroads, let's say, no? And Emmanuel also with the, the term accessibility is, uh, I think it's it's a nice door opener, no? That that can be seen in different dimensions. Um, I was very impressed by, by Sarah's work with data that, that really empower local communities. I think this is really fantastic. And uh, we are trying in smaller scales, no, something like, like uh, well, citizen research or, or things, no, that let's say also try to, to really activate um, citizens to, to contribute no, in gathering us data. And in many cases, no, then let's say we can't deal with, with all of this. No? So I'm really inspired to organize better ways to, to, to deal with this, maybe also with social media and so on. No? So let's say not only to, to use the top-down data, so you say to say, you know, but let's say creatively to generate data you know, from bottom up <clears throat> that then can be maybe fed you know, in a sort of dynamic you know, between the two levels. This would interest me a lot. <clears throat> yeah. In fact, I advocate for that in another chapter of the book. Um, <laughs> we should have time to talk about it, but I do think it's this interflow, um, you know, both top down and bottom up that uh, create these missing data sets that are important for making, like really important. And I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, how much we don't know about different, um, let's say processes and how they're affecting the people on the ground, if you really can collect like, you know, that kinds of data, you yeah. can make more informed decisions. Yeah. I think this, uh, let's say climate change, no, on one hand is, it can be really, be very manifest, no, with heat stress that really people have, no, and always floods or, no, and, but in many other aspects, it's quite difficult to grasp, no. And, and uh, let's say also science is developing quite fast no? in, in analyzing and especially in talking about the strategies. No? And probably this, this, and we saw it also in the COVID situation, no? like how difficult it is to explain to people that science is not science, but it's constantly moving. And we are all, all on the trip you now to find something out, basically, you know, and not to tell people what it is. <clears throat> and um, this is, I think, in, in regarding climate change, it's a bit similar, you no, know, but in an in a even more complex issue, you no. Know? And so the idea really actively to, to um, engage people you now in our work as, as in research. Can, can be really an interesting topic, no? How to do this exactly? Well, there are first tries, but we'll probably need also a lot of experimentation. <clears throat> can I just make a couple of responses to those? Responses? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, th I don't think anybody, um, that is deeply involved in, in the creativity of design work ever, ever believes that the data that they're using is absolute truth. I mean, that's just, um, data is, is a polemical tool and it can only go so far. Um, 
And in some ways, I'd say we almost, I, I, I totally agree, we, we don't know very much about the Earth system and how it functions as, a, as, a, as a, um, an integrated model. We don't have a model of the Earth system yet that can do that. That's so that in that sense, the data or the science is lacking. But on the other hand, you could also say that we suffer from too much data. There's a data deluge. And there's a kind of a visualization of data as a new sublime where, you know, there's just an avalanche of information about a changing environment. And it becomes, it, it, it can also incapacitate you. So the question is how you can turn data through creative processes and use it polemically to actually generate something that will have, a, have agency is, is the challenge. Um, and what happens is that, so for example, the way I've been using data is to play the game of using the data as, and keep a straight face, you know, and, it, it, and, and you, you know, using things like statistical targets, GIS mapping, and then you, you just use those tools to kind of get into the room and get into the game and get into the argument. But everyone knows that when it comes to actually designing something, even something very, very simple, like a connection between point A and point B, A being a protected area and B being a protected area, I just want to get a connection between those two things. That is infinitely complex when you actually get on the ground. And, and so the problem with data is then, will you? people tend to think, well, if I just get more data, I'll be able to find the answer, which is absurd because you end up trying to chase the data on every single molecule, which is just madness. Um, so that would be my response to that, the, 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 just the issue of data, which has been raised. But the other thing I'd like to say that, that I think where Jorg is kind of going is, also something I see a lot of in the United States at the moment, and that is the kind of, and Jorg, I don't want to mischaracterize your project because you presented so many different and interesting things, but one aspect of, I think, the way you just responded was there's a sense that it's virtuous and it's a good thing insofar as possible to defer design to the community. You know, the community becomes a kind of a cure-all. And I, I worry about that too. I think there's a sort of romanticization of the community as a bottom-up, as anti-top-down. And I, I understand the politics of it. I understand the philosophical position and I largely agree with it, but it can also be exaggerated. Um, so I think that's a point that I would is worth making. Just, um, just a curiosity is um, um, I appreciate uh, very, very much uh, all your um, uh, lectures um, and uh, um, a curiosity was um, in dealing uh, with these uh, complex scenarios uh, you all have so well explained. Um, somehow I'm asking myself uh, which strategy uh, is the most effective? I mean, uh, I, I know that the strategy is, depends from the uh, problem you are dealing with, but uh, uh, do we need really uh, um, a comprehensive design or something like a general plan or should we uh, use more uh, uh, um, guerrilla-like uh, instrument, uh, uh, trying to uh, insert uh, our design project uh, through things. Uh, I know it's a very bright uh, question, but uh, just for uh, hearing uh, something more from you. Are you talking about incrementalism versus master planning? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Are you, is your question, is incrementalism or master planning better? Uh, yes, somehow you can summarize uh, like that if you like. Uh, the, how, how much the, uh, the, in dealing with, uh, with uh, a, a very, the, with those large scale problems, uh, how much is, uh, the general picture is important and how much uh, uh, 
it doesn't the uh, and the, um, because many times uh, it changes uh, during during the during the process somehow and uh, um, yes that wasn't I think it's a great question and it's a question of design what is the most effective way for design to have agency and it's probably a mistake to generalize but the way out of making that mistake is to reply that design really gets agency when it is tuned to the system with which it's engaging so design i think the answer to your question is design is most powerful and effective when it's catalytic when it uses time it's temporally based um, and it gets inside a, a, a specific cultural and, and ecological system. Then it can generate things from the inside out. But having said that, I do believe politically you need some correlation between bottom up and top down. So sociologically, you need top down. You also need bottom up and you need synergy between those two things. But to the, the answer from a systems perspective is that when design gets inside a system and can use the energy of the system itself, over time, then it can be really powerful. In other words, if you take the human body as a metaphor, it's much more powerful to get inside a cell and rework the DNA or the RNA than it is to cut off an entire leg of a patient. You know, you just to use a medical analogy. Um, so ecologically, I think the, I think design has to try to kind of tunnel into the world, tunnel into systems, tunnel into the earth, and then emerge out of uh, and and harness those processes for and redirect the ecological flows to some extent. I hope I'm not being too abstract, but I'm trying to answer your question. No, I mean, I think Richard, you're absolutely right. I mean, but it's it does get drive into the heart of it, which is, is the politics, right? And that incrementalism responds to the, the politics in a way by giving the ability to prototype larger change that can then manifest itself into a bigger plan. Um, and I think, you know, the, you know, interest in pop-up spaces, incremental planning and so forth comes from the lack of ability to change at these broader scales because of the political factors at play and that incrementalism gives us prototypes which allow politicians to feel comfortable with then this bigger speculative ideas. Um, so I think they kind of work together. There's not one or the other. Um, they kind of work hand in hand. And I think that's kind of what you were saying, Richard, but uh, maybe differently. I agree. I think it's not, uh, you know, we do things from top down or bottom up, but I think this notion of reversibility is quite important. And I think that's the reversibility in the sense that uh, how do we start from small to large and how or how we go back to from large to small and again not as a as a, as a way to um uh it's really the, in the design process in the sense that uh how uh how do we meet not only in the middle but also how do we understand the issue from uh, both perspectives so to me it's not okay is the master plan or the prototype or vice versa or the scenario planning right but it's how do we operate to me also, uh, I would say in a localized condition that respond to uh, respond to always to, to to larger issues and systems. So I think even we work in the most uh, peri-urban area in Bogota in one single house, right? In a one single dwelling. At the same time, is the question: How do we reverse or we uh, trace back? I would say to the larger scale the issue of how we operate at the smallest, smallest scale, even at the microscope, you know, in the cell level, let's say. And that to me, you know, that's, that's how we, uh, it, again, it, it relates to systemic thinking, holistic thinking, uh, processes from top down, bottom up, et cetera, mm. reversibility or not. But mm. in the end, to me, it's, it's the question, it's still open, right? But also it's, it's, it's important to understand uh, uh, big challenges that we have now. You know, we all talk about big challenges. What are these big challenges? How many challenges do we have? We know and we don't know at the same time. Because I agree that in the end, uh, the, 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 the agency of design is important. And uh, uh, how do we operate through design and actually how design becomes uh, empowering? I think, Sarah, the interesting, 
you know, super interesting, you know, the part about data. I, I work with data as well. So I'm, <laughs> I, I connect directly with your work strongly. And, you know, there are a lot of big debates. How do we work? Who owns data? How this is geopolitical problem, et cetera. Uh, how do we, uh, you know, not only visualize, but uncover, et cetera. And I think this notion of empowerment is, is quite, it, it's very powerful. And, uh, and it, to me, it comes from working in a very localized, a specific condition, but at the same time being aware of the larger systems around. And this in the end, what this event is about. So how do we understand archipelagos that are specific to uh, not only localized, but let's say expand the territories that at the same time we understand Earth and the planet as a whole and how we go back and forth. And so lots of work to do, I would say. And, <laughs> and I think with that, uh, Emanuele, uh, maybe then you want to say something? Yeah. Well, I, I just pop in my mind one, one comment about what Richard was saying before that for me was really inspiring about the significance of design um, and when uh, it stops to be a category of human action you know, for prefiguring collective needs in response to, I would say, the transformation of the space and the society. Well, uh, this is probably also a very crucial argument, no? Because many times we are talking about design as an instrument for policies and becomes a more a tool for empowering people. And we are talking about co-design and, and, and action like this. And we were discussing now about the this two limits no, of the discussion, top-down or bottom-up approach and so on and so forth. All of this, me recalls the monumental work of Jan Friedman, no, who was discussing about the value of public domain as a basis condition for every urban transformation. And, and what is inspiring me in this discussion was it could be still a role for the radical planning method or radical thinking. As, as a method to prefigure alternative form of habitability in in the world of um, the, in this archipelagos, no, and 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 just to continue, um, I remember uh, this um, book by Tony Morrison, no, it reminds us. Uh, I think the title was Paradise from 1997. All paradises and all utopias are designed by who is not there and by the people who are not allowed in. No? And this makes us always reflect about how utopias can become uh, easily dystopias in a way. And, and so the role of design. I mean, we are as architects uh, um, very... Um, entrusted by, by the people to, to be the one to try to also to respond society needs and, and so on and so forth. So I think this the social role of architecture and then the significance of design as a category of human action is really important. It was not really a question, but just more like a flux of thoughts that mm -hmm. uh, I would like to share with you. Yeah, I think like one thing that I wanna kind of respond to the this data thing that Richard talked about earlier, and I agree that data cannot make necessarily a better design, and more data does not necessarily increase design. What I was trying to talk about with missing data is like you know even some of those world maps they're create they're not accurate, right? Um, they're oh. they're they're uh, interpolated, they're projective, and I guess like what bothers me in some like let's say not in the design world necessarily but that people think it's fact um these interpolations of climate conditions in the global south you know they're based off of like maybe five temperature thermometers that are then interpolated across the whole entire continent you know and that somehow we know what's going to happen in these areas, um, but actually based on very limited data that's then been aggregated and then pre represented to us as a fact, we're actually we're missing huge pieces of information that can actually help us improve the climate conditions in that area. And so I guess what my 
interest is in, in I guess, more data is, is making sure people are not, you know, when you see a whole landmass colored something, we think that that data exists, but it's actually a speculation. Um, and um, yep. that we can know how to answer that speculation is actually untrue. Totally agree. <laughs> But I think, I think we that, that making that awareness to, I think the public is part of the problem of climate communication, right? In that, that there's an assumption that we know, like that there's a lot that we know about climate in many regions and then particularly the archipelago, there's so much we don't know um, is I guess an assumption that I'd like to break down in order for us to actually make those important, you know, get those important decisions made to protect, can maybe not protect, but redesign those uh, constructs. Well, the creative, yeah, I agree. The creative challenge is really how we, I mean, designers are trying to design in a way that is cognizant of hyper objects and they're by definition kind of invisible. So we rely on the data to help us visualize and polemic, make it polemical. But it, of course, it's dangerous when people um, use it as a way of um, as pretending that it's the, the truth. Of course, that's dangerous. So then getting back to a, the comment just previously about that, I think the design project has to in spirit be always be subversive to some degree particularly with regard to politics and the way and politics now. I mean, there's, there's no future for design in, in the endless perpetuation of luxury products. And there's no future for design that is just instrumental and, and enslaved to the political class. It has design has to be subversive because it's only through subversion that life can find freedom. And freedom for me is the creativity of life and design's purpose is to make more life. You know, whereas at the moment we live in a, on a planet with a death cult mm -hmm. dominated by politicians who are just fuckwits and, you know, I, I, fuck politics. It's so bad. Design's beautiful and creative and life-giving. That's what we need. More life. We're all a community of designers. Here. I think we all agree with that, Richard. <laughs> so, <laughs> great. I think with that, we can take a couple of... Uh, questions from the audience so we already passed the two hours so um so the questions uh, could go live or also you can put it in the chat so if you have any questions from the audience yes so we have some comments so yeah i think we can take a couple of questions Um, I see here actually a comment um, that um, this is for Richard from Luciano Briena, uh, and I think that could be maybe something that we can discuss further. Um, so the idea of an interconnected network of protected areas remind me to uh, uh, an inverted version of Constantino uh, Doxiadis uh, Ecumenopolis on which that is interconnected in is urban settlement while protected areas and close with them. So this is, I think it's one comment uh, during your presentation, Richard, if there is something you want to expand on that a little bit. I'm just trying to remember his, his um, drawing for that. But I think it was, it was the urbanization of, it was a, the flips model, right? Is that what, what the comment is about? I'm not really I think so. I think so. So total urban total planetary urbanization with the yeah. fragments of so-called nature. I mean it's a it's a kind of a Manhattan a Central Park model. Mm -hmm. I I don't I mean I don't I don't concur with that. I think the 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 planet can't function unless it's got an integrated system of networked biodiversity, which it opens up a whole different cartography. If you follow the way water moves, soil, species, and map that over time, you find you get a very complex mosaic, which is, has to be networked 
and urbanization has to step back from that. I'm not saying urbanization and, and I'm not saying at all nature and culture are two different systems and they have to be decoupled. I'm saying the opposite. They have to be integrated and enmeshed in a much more complicated synthetic order. And that opens up a very different idea of the city. And, and um, I, I think, you know, for the, for the last 15 or so years, the discourse of landscape urbanism and ecological urbanism which is very familiar to Europeans in a sense, because Europe has been a design, an urban design project for so much longer in many ways. But that, that proje the project of landscape urbanism that some of us have been a part of is, has, has really been a sort of groping towards new ideas of the city as a system that can be integrated with landscape. And that's a really, that's a really difficult design that's a kind of reaching for the new city, for a future city that I think is really important, almost in an evolutionary sense, to try and get us to a more ecological, metabolic idea of the city. And um, we're nowhere near it yet. We don't, but, but I think that's what, that, that's the creative challenge, certainly to get this back to urban design. Mm -hmm. um, how do you integrate systems that we previously referred to as nature on the one hand and culture on the other, and then mesh them together into a sophisticated new kind of synthesis is really fascinating mm -hmm. on every level, as you say, from the smallest scale to the whole city scale, to the regional scale, and then to the planetary scale. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Well, I think th this notion of synthetic approach is very important because I think when we talk about synthetic, it's not, it's about action and design. And right. so it's to bring all the parameters together and, uh, and really looking at a synthetic approach, I think, through design. So, um, yes, I think uh, lots, you know, still lots of work to do, but definitely. I think maybe we are beyond of what we think about landscape and urbanism, right? But we go back and learning from that, going back into the small scale somehow. And, uh, and I agree with that. Um, so we have. Uh... We need a new model. I mean, we 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 can't. The idea of the modern city doesn't work. Broadacre city doesn't work. Um, garden cities don't work. Well, they they all all those models have some validity, but they're not. We we need new models for sure. Mm -hmm. So we have one more comment here um, from our chair. So it will be interesting to cross compare the two globes at the opening of Richard's presentation, physical urbanization and protected areas with the globe seen as mesh of moving information. So going back to Sarah and virtual movement, what Purini called some years ago, the analog city. So in this case, meshing the two together. Mm, right. So, That was a comment, right? Not There's a, a comment. Yes, yes. If anybody would like to spend, otherwise we can take one more question. In uh, and uh, we have actually one more question here for Sarah. Um, so data is an intuitive part of design. Interesting. We used yesterday data to design today. What we will build tomorrow? If this statement holds true, how do we manipulate that data in a predictive way to design for the future? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, data can inform, let's say, um, I, I totally agree with what Richard say. It's, it's used as a, a tool to inform previous processes um, and outcomes in order for you to think about projective futures, right? So how did, how did the city change? Uh, how the structures change based on different kinds of influence, injections, interventions, and data can allow us to understand um, those kind of performances of flows um, that then we can use as ways to project into the future. I hate um, when people say, let's use data to predict futures because I think it's impossible. It's a thing that um data scientists have been trying to do for centuries right like can we you know 
And I think that we can make informed decisions about potential growth patterns. Um, and um, we can use, let's say, um, that informed models to help us, um, you know, protect um, growth or development. Um, but, you know, date, like you're using exactly past data to make a projective future. And um, you don't know, like there's going to be a pandemic or these other kinds of things. So I, I think these kind of predicted things are just loose tools to help us understand potential futures and we can use that um, to speculate on design decisions. Um, I guess like I, I guess I'm wondering if you're talking about like fractal cities or you know these other kinds of tools of agency that uh, people use to model with data which I think are highly problematic um, but um, like obviously I I am a data enthusiast you know <laughs> sound like I'm saying data is bad, but I, I think that it's, um, I don't like the idea of techno solutionism, right? But rather that we use data to make informed decisions, to start conversations, um, to generate the knowledge that's needed to make uh, innovation and innovative. Yeah. I agree. I think, you know, when sometimes we talk about data, there is this notion of technological determinism that comes into the surface. And I agree with you, it's the opposite, right? How we, uh, is, is technological determinism is really top down, I think. So whereas so there is a, the, the, the other approach that uh, starts from, again, looking from different perspective. Right. Um, Take the ghost cities phenomenon, we can be projective about where these ghost cities are going to exist. And we like learn that phenomenon. How do we then cut that phenomenon off, right? And use the data more as a like a responsive tool, um, mm -hmm. responding to that design problem, even maybe taking some of the ideas of the amenities and how do you exploit them um, in a way to then reverse the process. Um, so we have one more uh, comment and maybe we can close with that. And this is relates to, to the question. So data colonialism and data des desert are two very interesting realities of our data scapes that we need to further explore as a proactive way to participate in designing more balanced and sustainable environments. Globalism means also an expanded approach to the meaning of collective responsibility. I agree, I think this goes back to lots of things that be raised, especially talking about um, action. So these are comments from the audience. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, I think maybe we can close the event. Um, Manuele Vittorio, yes? I would say yes, even if it's <laughs> very interesting to discuss yes. with you. I really hope we can uh, further collaborate together. And we are looking for the next episode of all archipelagos of yes. uh, changing habitats. So thank you everyone again. And thank you the audience for participating. Thank you to the speakers for the amazing contribution. Thanks again to University of Genova. So we look forward to engaging in the future discussions. Thanks everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you, you. Marcella and everyone. Marcella and everyone. Thank Thanks you. to New York Institute of Technology for the organization. The amazing job. Yes, Thanks a lot to you. everyone. Bye.